So <clears throat> my name is Vasily Mosin. I'm an industrial PhD student at Volvo Cars and uh, University of Gothenburg. <clears throat> the title of uh, today's presentation is Anomaly Detection in Driving Scenario Images with Autoencoders. Um, I'm working together with my supervisors, Darko Durisic from Volvo Cars and Miroslav Staren from University of Gothenburg. And uh, I want to start with a short video uh, about why do they need this anomaly detection at all. This is a, I will play it. This is a recent case that happened 10 days ago in Taiwan. Model, uh, Tesla Model 3 actually on a highway with a turned on highway pilot uh, crashed into the truck lying in the middle of a highway. And it's, yeah, it's a sad story, but it's a descriptive example of that why it's actually important to have an anomaly detection algorithm in self-driving cars, because it's obviously that uh, the, a truck, a white truck lying in the middle of a highway is a, is anomaly. And also uh, the roof was white color and uh, uh, it seems like the object detection algorithm missed it up with the sky or something. So yeah, this is like background of why we need anomaly detection. Uh, next uh, slide, uh, I want to talk a, a little bit about my our general topic, which is develop project. Um, we are working on the architectural design and verification and validation of systems with machine learning components. And it basically consists of two different parts, uh, which are uh, architectural part. We need to define and evaluate different architectural styles and, and patterns. And also uh, verification part. Uh, we want to develop methods for validation and verification of systems with machine learning components. And uh, in this, oops, sorry, in this uh, uh, project, in this presentation, uh, I will focus on the validation part. We can outline three research questions here. First, first research question relates to requirements. It's uh, we can formulate it as a, how we can break down high-level requirements. Um, on the training and test data sets in order to uh, to be sure that uh, we covered all the uh, valid set of inputs. Uh, the second research question relates to the testing phase. We want to use this uh, uh, breakdown requirements and uh, validate and uh, evaluate how much of this data we covered during the training and testing. And then uh, the last one is for runtime when we uh, want to make sure that during the run time in the cell driving car, for example, we uh, we allow only the input data which is coming from the distribution similar to the to those which was used during the training and to reject uh, those data which coming out of uh, from out of training uh, data distribution. And this is exactly what uh, what this anomaly detection project is about. Here we comes to the concept of the safety cage. Um, uh, this uh, safety cage allows uh, to actually implement this anomaly detection in, in a self-driving car for uh, some uh, deep learning system or machine learning system inside. It can be for, for simplicity, let's assume it's object detection algorithm in a self-driving car. So we have this deep learning system uh, and we want to make sure that, for example, it was it, uh, if this object detection algorithm was trained uh, on uh, images from uh, Swedish roads with mooses, and uh, once it's, we have a kangaroo image uh, apparently, like, and uh, we want uh, we want to reject this image, and we want to uh, to indicate that we don't want to trust this uh, prediction of the object detection algorithm here, and we will make uh, some safe action instead of uh, relying on the automatic object detection algorithm. And here we can also distinguish between three different uh, techniques for building this supervisor for, for this machine learning algorithm here. Uh, the first one, it's, uh, it's about that looking inside of the actual object detection algorithm, looking into the neuron activation statistics. And for this, we actually need this object detection algorithm uh, to, have, to have the code of this. Uh, the second one, which we, uh, which we are, I will talk about, is autoencoder-based uh, anomaly detection. Here, we, for this uh, technique, we implement uh, a separate, uh, a separate uh, algorithm 
which is based on autoencoder, and we run it in parallel with public detection algorithm here. And uh, it uh, output the anomaly score of the input data. Uh, and for this, we don't need to have this um, object detection algorithm here. We just can train it separately, this autoencoder. And uh, the third option is to use runtime data augmentation. And it's actually related to manipulation of the input data. So during the uh, perception phase and inference phase, when we detect objects, we uh, manipulate uh, input data several times and augment it and uh, see how, for different modifications, how the object detection algorithm behaves. And uh, based on this, we either trust or reject the input data. Yeah, and here, yes, in this project, I'm talking about autoencoder based. And what is the autoencoder? Autoencoder is a special type of uh, neural networks. Uh, it actually has uh, the input and the output the same. Uh, and the main goal uh, of the autoencoder was uh, solving the task of dimensionality reduction. It's mainly used for dimensionality reduction of images. So it basically had the bottleneck uh, so-called bottleneck in the middle, in between of this autoencoder, uh, and it has encoder and decoder part. So, uh, yeah, so we have uh, also two different approaches for an autoencoder-based anomaly detection. Uh, the first one is using the construction error approach, when we calculate the reconstruction error between the input and the output image, and we use this reconstruction error as an anomaly score, as an indicator how much uh, our output data deviates from the input data because the assumption is that if we train autoencoder uh, only on the normal data without using anomaly data, then we will uh, be able to reconstruct the normal data during the, the runtime uh, very good. So the reconstruction er error will be, will be low. And uh, if we uh, feed the uh, anomaly data into the autoencoder during the runtime, then it will not be able to reconstruct this data very very good, and uh, we will have a higher reconstruction error. So we can use it as anomaly score. And the second approach is to use bottleneck values uh, in the middle of the autoencoder, because uh, the assumption is that autoencoder learns some important information inside of inside of it, and we can basically use these bottleneck values. It's basically a feature vector. And we can use traditional uh, anomaly detection algorithms on these uh, bottleneck values. So next important thing is to mention about different types of anomalies, which can be uh, monitored uh, during the uh, uh, cell driving uh, run. Uh, there are two types. The first one on the left, you can see it's uh, when we use a whole thing is anomaly, uh, meaning that it can be uh, either different weather conditions. Uh, for example, it can be rain or fog or night. Uh, we can say that this is anomaly, or it can be in different landscape. For example, when we trained our object detection algorithm on a highway and uh, we want to use it uh, in the city uh, traffic scenario, it also will be anomaly for the object detection algorithm. And um, on the right, uh, you can see a much uh, more difficult case, uh, which is when we uh, when we say that some uh, some particular type of object is anomaly, which will which was unseen during the training phase, because uh, for example here if the uh, machine learning model or object detection algorithm was trained on empty highways without cars. And once we feed into this object detection algorithm image with cars, uh, it will not understand what to, what, what to do with this uh, car. It will classify it wrongly. Or another case when we trained it on cars, but we want to also uh, detect uh, pedestrians, it also, uh, pedestrians will be also anomalous in our case because it will output some, some wrong decision because it hasn't seen this uh, pedestrians during, during the training phase. Uh, it also can be some new state of the object, for example, position orientation, for example, pedestrian upside down, it will be also anomaly if it was not presented in the training set. And uh, what we also observed during preliminary research that uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, all of the existing anomaly detection algorithms, they are 
very dependent on the color information on the pixel uh, brightness values presented in the images and uh, i will show you later what uh, what is it yeah here so uh, we wanted uh, we wanted to compare these two described earlier approach for anomaly detection based on autoencoders uh, mainly reconstruction error approach and bottleneck values we wanted to estimate the performance of anomaly detection and also we wanted to compare them between each other uh, and uh, for this, we use the generated data from ProCivic. Uh, of course, the ultimate goal is to apply our anomaly detection algorithm on uh, real data. But we are currently on the experimental phase, and um, during this phase, we can manipulate the colors uh, and uh, objects easily on, in the generation uh, in the generation engine. And then we are going to already apply it on the real data. So for now, it's only generated data. So here you can see that uh, we consider the case when we have a, uh, um, anomalies, uh, when we have cars and as anomalies. Uh, so we consider normal scenario when we have an empty road. And uh, once we have a car here or motorcycle or truck, we consider this image as an uh, as anomalous image. Uh, yeah, it's very simplified case. But uh, it's also uh, is a, is a descriptive. The results are very descriptive, uh, and we consider three different uh, scenarios when we take original images with uh, all the colors. The second one is more tricky. Uh, we change the all yellow bright uh, bright yellow colors in the images to the gray to see how how it will influence the results of anomaly detection, and also here we consider the case when we remove the color information completely from the images. We, uh, trans, uh, we transform it to grayscale images. And we had uh, 256 training images for training our autoencoder model. And we had 100 normal and 31 anomalous uh, images for testing uh, our anomaly detection algorithm. Uh, a little bit about the model itself. So here is our actual autoencoder. Uh, it consists of the encoder part and decoder part. Encoder uh, ends here. So we had a, we have a three convolutional plus pooling uh, layers, and in the decoder part we have three deconvolutional and uh, upsampling layers. Uh, so we implemented it in uh, Keras, a simple model. We trained it with optimizer Ada Delta. We used mean squared loss function, trained for 1,000 epochs, and used uh, batch size equals 10. So yeah, a little bit technical information. Uh, it's supported for reproducibility of our results. Uh, and then we actually the first step was that we have visualized our anomaly scores returned by our autoencoder based anomaly detection algorithms and here we put uh, these uh, plots for every case for original images modified images and grail scale images and for different approach reconstruction error and bottleneck values uh, lower row and uh, we can see that for when we use the original images we have we had a very clear separation. Not very. We had some uh, intersection here, but uh, these two groups of normal and anomalous images were uh, we could separate with some threshold here. Once, oops. Once we change uh, the color of the yellow cars to the gray, uh, this peak uh, uh, was a little bit smoothed, and the intersection became uh, bigger. Uh, and when uh, we used grail scaled images, we were mixing up two sets of images, normal and anomalous images completely, or more or less completely. So these two distributions of anomaly scores for normal and anomalous images uh, were put it on each other. And uh, in order to compare the results uh, numerically, we have considered this anomaly detection task as a binary classification problem. So uh, we use this anomaly detection as a binary classificator, saying that uh, outputting that either is that anomaly or not. And uh, from here, we can see that putting a different threshold on the anomaly score, we can put it here or here. Uh, using a different threshold, we can obtain different 
true positive and false positive rates. And uh, we actually can plot these true positive rates and false positive rates for different threshold values of, on anomaly detection scores. And uh, this thing will, uh, it's, it's called receive operating characteristic curve. Uh, it's usually used for, uh, for assessing the performance of binary classification problem. And uh, also we can calculate the area under this curve and uh, it will correspond to the overall performance of uh, anomaly detection. And uh, this area under this curve can vary from zero to one. And um, once it's uh, closer to one, uh, the performance of anomaly detection is higher because we want to have this curve going to the left top corner, closer to the left top corner, where, where we have 100% true positive rate and uh, zero false positive rate. And uh, looking at the left picture, uh, this, uh, this is the case when we used original images with all the colors. And they see that the reconstruction error approach outperforms a little bit the bottleneck values approach uh, according to roca Oak score, area under curve. Uh, when we change the color of the yellow cars to the gray cars, and motorcycles and trucks, uh, we actually see that uh, reconstruction error approach performance uh, decreases a little bit, up to 0 0.947, while the bottleneck values wasn't affected by this change, changing of the color. And also, once we have a grail scale images on the right, we, uh, we see that uh, bottleneck uh, values approach still shows some more or less good performance uh, with uh, Roca Oak score equals 0 0.871. But the reconstruction error approach almost approaching the random guessing uh, line, which is approaching 0 0.5 Roca Oak score, where we have a random guessing action. And uh, from this, we can uh, conclude that uh, uh, this bottleneck values approach it wasn't affected by the modification of the color information, but the reconstruction error approach uh, was influenced a lot. So we're changing the color, only, only yellow colors to the gray, and it's, we already see significantly, significant drop in the performance of anomaly detection for reconstruction error approach. And uh, for the grail scale images uh, also, it decreases even more. And what is also important here, if we look at the point where we have a true positive rate equals 100%. Uh, this is the most important point from, uh, from the perspective of cell driving context, because we want to have this true positive rate always to be 100%. We want to detect all the anomalies, but at the same time, we want to maintain a, a relatively low false positive rate, which is the case for a bottleneck values approach, because we can see from the pictures, it allows to have a for example, in the case of original images on the left uh, plot, we can see that we have a 100% true positive rate uh, at this point, and uh, we have less than 0.2 false positive rate of anomaly detection. While for reconstruction approach, it's, it's not the case. When we have a 100% true positive rate for reconstruction approach, we, we actually detect more, more than 60% of false positive anomalies, which is not which is not good. Um, yeah, and um, to conclude, uh, so I've presented uh, two different approaches of autoencoder-based anomaly detection on a high level. Uh, I discussed how it, how it is used in the context of a safety cage because it's important to understand how it can be uh, uh, how can it be used uh, in the actual cell driving car architecture and uh, it's actually acts as a safety cage. So we detect anomalies and we actually trust or reject the uh, output of the, uh, our deep learning model. Uh, also, we estimated and compared the performance of two autoencoder-based methods using a simple uh, use case scenarios on generated data. Uh, we also showed that uh, reconstruction error approach performance, uh, it's basically uh, can be, uh, it's affected a lot by the color manipulation on the images, while the bottleneck approach wasn't affected so much, at least when we change the yellow cars to the gray, uh, to the gray color of, the, of our cars. 
but in general also when we used grail scaled images bottleneck wireless approach also sh showed the high performance of anomaly detection and this bottleneck wireless approach also allows us to maintain a 100% true positive rate with uh, less than 0.2 false positive rate, which is also good in the context in the context of uh, autonomous driving. Uh, and uh, these things, uh, they are kind of interest can be uh, correlated with the results of Smile 2 project, which was uh, finished a recent time ago, and uh, there. Authors also this, uh, investigated this problem of uh, anomaly detection and safety cages, and uh, there they they more were focused more on the uh, different types of anomalies rather than objects. They were focused on the weather conditions and less landscape scenarios, but uh, we also think that the, when we have objects as anomalies. It's uh, it's more difficult, and uh, we also need to work on uh, in this direction. And the future research may inc uh, may and have to have inc have to include the experiments with more complex autoencoder architectures because uh, the architecture which I showed you was a simple one with only three convolutional and three deconvolutional layers in the encoder and decoder. But there are of course more complicated autoencoders, and maybe they will allow to get a better score. Uh, of course, using the real data, uh, we want to move to real data scenario mm -hmm. and um, also considering different uh, objects as anomalies because it was a simple case when we had the cars and the empty roads as a normal images, but uh, it's more difficult when we want to consider, for example, images with cars and uh, cyclists, but we want to detect uh, pedestrians or animals as anomalies or animals which were not presented in the training set like mooses versus kangaroos. Uh, yeah, so uh, this this research will allow uh, us to make these things not happen in the future, hopefully. Uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention and uh, I'm ready for the questions. Thank you very much, Vasily. Do we have any questions? I don't have any questions, but I would like to remind everyone that the plenary session starts again at 15.15. There seems to be some confusion that some people think that the keynote starts at 1600, but that is incorrect. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands that we are continuing at 15.15, so in 12 minutes.